There we go. So, so we know we're being recorded here. Um, so, so thank you. As I said, uh, I'm Anne Harding and happy to, to be hosting this today. I'll, I'll begin um, with, with an acknowledgement. I'm, I'm blessed to be here in Treaty 7 territory, home of Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Um, I've, I've lived in this territory for my whole life, um, but it wasn't until probably about 17 years ago that uh, when I had finished my, my education in, uh, through high school in K-12 and mostly into university, that I actually learned about the, the first peoples of this territory and, and this land. I had the beautiful opportunity um, to do some, some work with young people at uh, Sutena Nation and Siksika Nation and to visit those communities and, uh, and just learn about this whole other part of Canada that had been hidden from me and from many Canadians. Um, and, and so I'm grateful for, for this land and for the people who have been in this land um, for generations and all that I've, I've had to benefit from, from this territory. Um, and, and I wanna also just take a moment to acknowledge the day. Uh, we are here today on Canada's first official National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Uh, this is part of, of our national healing process, these commemoration activities um, so that so that we don't forget and um, don't and that we learn we take the time to to reflect and learn and so thank you for being here. Um, but also I think in what you'll hear from from our panelists too is is that we learn and we reflect and then we act and then we do something different and then we take a step and so you're one of your steps is being here with us today and, and we really appreciate that and hope that we spark some ideas. Uh, for additional action in the future, because it's only all as as a country together when everybody cares that that we end up with a different different nation one that's more equitable. Um, and I also want to share share this clip from Senator Murray Sinclair because I think it just says um, says why we're here and what this day is about uh, better certainly than I could. Many people have said over the years that uh, I've been involved in the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Why can't you just get over it and move on? And my answer has always been, why can't you always remember this? Because this is about memorializing those people who have been victims of a great wrong. Why don't you tell the United States to get over 9-11? Why don't you tell this country to get over all of the veterans who died in the Second World War instead of honoring them once a year? Why don't you tell your families to stop thinking about all of your ancestors who died? Why don't you turn down and, and burn down all of those headstones that you put up for all of your friends and relatives over the years? It's because it's important for us to remember. We learn from it. And until people show that they have learned from this, we will never forget. And we should never forget even once they have learned from it because this is a part of who we are. It's not just a part of who we are as survivors and children of survivors and relatives of survivors, but as part of who we are as a nation. And this nation must never forget what it once did to its most vulnerable people. And so thank you to, to Senator Sinclair for everything that you've offered this country and to, and to all the Indigenous leaders who continue to, to be so gracious as to teach Canadians our, our history. And so we have a number with us here today. Um, and, and just I want to give a big thank you to, to everyone who's joined us. Um, this, this webinar is, is kid friendly. So I want to give a shout out to Jenny Cull who like stopped me at a play date that our kids were having. And she said, Hey, September 30th, do you know what's going on? What, what activities could we do? I said, Oh, okay. And I looked at some and there's some great activities happening all around today. Um, many of them hadn't emerged yet. And so I sort of went, okay, let's, maybe we can come up with something. And so this is intended or some of our kids are off school. And so thank you to all the little people who have joined us. Um, thank you to, to Bobby, my son, who is in one of these boxes somewhere, um, and to, to everybody who's joined us. So we, we are in a child-friendly space and also in a space to 
to have open age appropriate conversations. So we'll see how this goes. And that's a bit of an experiment. So we'll look forward to, to your feedback afterwards. Um, one of the activities Tiffany's shared in the chat is uh, some coloring pages. So coloring it forward is, is an initiative of Diana Frost um, based here in, in Treaty 7 territory in Calgary. She's collaborated with uh, Indigenous artists from across the country to create coloring books and coloring books that also hold teachings um, from different Indigenous communities. So there's a Blackfoot book and a Cree book and um, I believe an Anishinaabe book as well. And, and so thank you to her for offering us this freebie package. Um, she's given us permission to use it. You have permission to share it as well. Um, please get your kids coloring. And at the end, we would love to see some of those, uh, those pictures that they color throughout. So if you're able to print that and, and have them working on that, that's, uh, we'd appreciate that. I think that would be great. And so, yes, so this, these are some of the pictures that, that the kids would be coloring and some of the teachings that are held in that. So just a great big thank you to Diana Frost and Coloring It Forward. Please do visit their website, order the books and uh, or pick them up. I think Staples carries them um, and, and please encourage uh, your kids to learn and, uh, and have some fun with it as well. We, there's a lot of great people here too. And so you'll hear from our panelists shortly. We'd love to hear a bit from you. Um, please do feel free to, to post a note in the chat, uh, give a greeting, say hello, let us know where you're from, um, and what brings you here today? What are, what are you hoping to get from this conversation today? And, and then we can get to know each other a little bit more as well. I will note that we will be going into breakout rooms in about 20 minutes or so. Um, you'll also have the opportunity not to go into breakout rooms and to just listen to some music if that's if breakout rooms aren't really your thing. Um, but uh, we will have that opportunity for some more intimate conversation. But right now, it would be great to, to say hello. So hi, Sarah, really good that you could join us. Um, and, and please do use the chat to, to bring greetings and say hello to everyone here. It's, we're not able to be in person, so it's nice to feel like we're in this circle together and a nice wave there. Hi, Alan. Hi, Felix. Nice wave. Love that, guys. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to now now turn it over to the people who you've come here to, to listen to. Um, and so I'll stop sharing my screen and we will we'll focus on our panelists who are here to share their, their diversity of experiences and, and ideas and perspectives on supporting young people in their reconciliation journeys and very intentionally give credit to, uh, to our panelist, Mike, who um, has, has helped me with much of my language. And uh, he said, well, a kid's a goat. Stop saying kid. Uh, young people. This is a way of showing respect to young people. And so that is a variety of ages and, uh, and a thank you to, to, for everybody who's here with their young people and, and that variety of ages that we have. So we'll go through our panelists. I think we're starting with Justin and uh, we'll ask you to share, introduce yourself. We'll, we'll put your bio in the chat so folks can sort of look, look you up to learn more, but we'd love you to share a story or a memory um, related to a young person's reconciliation journey. Of course, yeah. Thank you, everybody. And I uh, just want to echo Anne with acknowledgement of, of today. I mean, my wife and, and my son, we went for a walk today. We did a five kilometer walk um, in support of FOA Canada. And throughout our walk, I, I was humbled to see the amount of orange shirts outside in the playground, playing, having fun. And it was so heartwarming to see that. You know, having Canada recognize this day as, as a statutory holiday to allow reconciliation, but more so in terms of Senator Murray to allow truth. And before we can get to reconciliation, we have to have truth. So I'm Justin Jimmy. I'm chair of Calgary Aboriginal Urban Affairs Committee. Um, I live and reside in Calgary on Treaty 7. Um, proud to say it's home since 2014. Prior to that, uh, I lived in Edmonton. Uh, and for me, my home community is Onion Lake Cree Nation, which is just north of Lloyd Minster. If anybody knows where that is. Lloyd Minster, Saskatchewan or Alberta, it's a bordering town. For me, my, my story with young people, when I moved to Calgary, I ended up taking a job with a children's services organization. 
And everybody in my family has worked in children's services or in that social well-being realm. I had uh, grandparents that worked in healthcare, education, human resources, treatment facilities, and children's services. So we're all in that area. We all just kind of evolved to that social well-being realm. So I took a position with a children's services agency, and throughout that, I was able to, my wife and I opened our home to be foster parents, and we took in children from Satana Nation and other uh, communities in the Calgary region who were removed from their home, removed from their community. And so we had discussions with them. We talked to them about their community, their culture. We'd go to powwow, we'd go to ceremony, and we would have those open discussions. And for them, that was an opportunity of reconciliation just from the start, right? Not deep. Right? You don't get too involved right away and, and get lost. Just have a discussion about it. Just see the culture, just see the powwow or a ceremony or a smudge. And they ask questions. And then those questions in turn get asked to other children, other community members, other family members, people in their education system, people in their school. And that evolves into more and more discussion. And that gets to the truth. And once we get to the truth, then we can move into reconciliation. Well, I'm happy to be here. And it's, again, so heartwarming to see everybody on these videos. It's exciting. And I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. I'm happy to have you. Uh, next, we'll hear from Henley, Henley Gordon. Hi everyone, uh, my name's Hannah Lee and I'm originally from Robinson Huron Treaty Territory. I've been a guest here in Treaty 7 Territory for about seven or eight years now. And I'm an early childhood educator. I'm also a settler and I mostly teach to settler children. So I'm coming here with that perspective and uh, kind of like from a settler experience. Um, I have two memories I want to share related to working with children and my reconciliation journey. And years ago when I was a teacher in a classroom, I tried to teach culture through storybooks. And I realized that I started taking more surface level or superficial activities or items from the story. So for example, I read a book called How About Counting in Cree by Penny Thomas. And we would look at the eagle feathers in the books, the clothing, the drumming, and I'd ask children to draw or recreate the images in the story. And the, the kiddos really happily did this and engaged in the activities. And for a long time, I thought that this was okay. And what I realized later was I was actually teaching consumption and appropriation of a culture. And I ended up seeing how this expands into the world where settlers are wearing costumes that mimic regalia and they might wear to uh, a music festival or Halloween and, and the true impacts that this has on, on individuals and communities. And I realized that I had a play in this because I was modeling this to children at a young age through my classroom and the way I was teaching. So deeper into my journey, I, shift, I learned that the shift from appropriation to appreciation can come through connection and understanding and deepening our uh, shared values and empathy. And so more recently, I re revisited the same book and with a new understanding of reconciliation. And the focus was on deepening a connection through shared experiences. And the shift that I saw was like so remarkable and so profound that I hope everyone gets to experience this with their young ones. And an example is we when we were talking about giving and receiving gifts, like the feather, I heard uh, one student had said, my granny gave me her rings and they're so special to me and we keep them safe. And 
that to me was a point of making a, a connection with shared experiences. And there was another example that to me was like so remarkable when we talked about having celebrations like a powwow. And I asked the kiddos, what kind of celebrations do you have at home? And one of the students said, I wanted to have a celebration this year, but I couldn't. And it was a birthday that he was talking about. And this was such a significant learning opportunity where we could ask then, how did it feel when you couldn't have the celebration? Or I could pose I wonder questions. I wonder if this happened to any of the children in the storybooks we read. And this created such a deeper level of thinking and understanding for our kids that now it wasn't about consuming a culture and reading books and taking something surface level. It was about digging deeper and, and leaning into the questions and the curiosity of our children to be able to ask more questions and uh, seek guidance ourselves or guide our kids and then use more books to hear from people with lived experiences. So from there, we read books that were more specific, specific on residential schools written by um, Rita Joe, the, um, I lost my talk talking about her experiences. So we were able to make those connections with personal, personal experiences. And that, that's uh, been for me what reconciliation is really about. Thanks so much, Henley. And just really appreciate you, you being here and sharing that journey as, as an early childhood educator. I know we have teachers on the line here as well, and, and I know they appreciate that. Uh, Michelle, over to you. Awesome. Oki Tanshe Tanse Ambawa Stitch Denatada. My name is Michelle Forney. My traditional name, my Blackfoot name is Datsikik Gunama Ikikstakiaki, which means center pole offering woman. So I work as a manager for the um, uh, Bow Valley College Indigenous Student Support Center in post secondary um, and at um, Aniko Khan Center, which means Buffalo Lodge. And then I also am a uh, facilitator for Métis Education for Rupert's Land Centre of Excellence. So today we're going to have a, a lot of fun learning about um, Métis history and culture um, and do a little game. So that's really exciting. I have two children, a two-year-old, a six-year-old, and my 18-year-old niece just moved out. So that was an experience. And um, uh, I had the um, opportunity to um, witness a Sundance in the summer. And I brought my son, so he's almost six. And the story that I want to share with you is his interpretation of the piercing Sundance. So if you don't know what that is, I can't tell you because I don't have the rights to talk about it. So I'll respect that protocol. But at one point, um, he did watch the piercing ceremony. So uh, there was a young man right beside him that he had just made friends with that he had been there, you know, for years and years since he was a baby. And so I asked this young man, I said, well, why do you, why do you think that they're doing that? Because um, I wanted to see his interpretation. And the young man said, well, I, I just don't know. It just doesn't make sense to me. And my son just put his hand over him on his chest, touched his heart and said, it's because they're preparing to be warriors, <laughs> you know, and it was just so, it was just so beautiful how he interpreted, you know, just the um, things that were happening and how we, he was witnessing and how to go around the circle and just teaching his little friends about protocol um, just by witnessing. And I think that those opportunities of being on the land with the people and learning and, and watching and even uh, witnessing the experience is just so powerful. So I was really proud of him in that moment. I couldn't take any credit, you know, I couldn't take any of it. And I just, I just wanted to honor him in that story. So thank you so much. I'm so happy to be um, here. Um, uh, Mike Lickers is my mentor. You know, I met him when I was 18 years old um, in, in the bush, you know, trying to define the word synergy. I still don't know what it means, but I ran up and down that hill, you know, and, and through that leadership program. So you never know who you're investing in and what's going to come of it. So I'm, I'm here because of people like Mike. So thank you. Oh, thank you so much for that story, Michelle. It's beautiful. Uh, Sandy. We'll go to you next. Well, 
Hello, everyone, and thank you all very much for joining us today. And just a shout out to Anne for, you know, reaching out to me to do this. Uh, very much appreciate it. So, um, Sandy Morso and Dijnakaj and Saging and Donjaba. And that's all I really know in my Ojibwe language. Um, I learned it when I was quite young, but unfortunately, when we moved to the city, um, my parents really wanted me just to, to speak English and to blend in with everybody. And so that's sort of, you know, the story I'm going to tell you is I, I am also the mother of a 19-year-old um, son, and his name is Sagate. And in our language, the Ojibwe language, it means sunshine or breaking through the clouds. And um, I remember when we named him, um, I got a lot of pushback from my parents. Um, they said, why would you do that to him? He's going to have a difficult time of it. And, um, and I'm happy to say that he is very proud to, you know, have that name. And he also has a traditional name. Um, but one of the things I wanted to share is because of the, uh, my both of my parents having gone to residential school, they really wanted us to blend in to not really focus on being Indigenous. And in fact, we lived in a very middle class environment. So I really didn't grow up with any of the traditions or, or culture. I'd never been to any powwows or anything like that. It was just something my parents didn't want to share. But as I grew older, um, I started to, and when I went on to university, I started to study a lot of it uh, myself and was really intrigued by everything I was hearing. And so I would go home and, um, you know, learn about the traditions and talk to some of the elders. And so I just thought that I just really was missing something. So, you know, fast forward many, many years later, and I'm... Um, a manager, um, I worked at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission as the engagement manager for the independent assessment process, which is for more of the severe physical abuses that the children suffered at the schools. And part of my role was attending um, events in community. And I had the opportunity for the first time ever to attend a round dance. Um, I'd never had the opportunity to do that. And I made sure that the staff that I had would attend the events. We wouldn't just go in and do our little spiel and our speech as government representatives, but actually be involved in the community. So I took a really different approach. We wanted to be part of, you know, any events that the community was having. So I participated in this round dance and I found it absolutely amazing. And like, um, I just, we were, I danced from like seven in the evening to like two in the morning. I could barely walk the next day with my hip because you're kind of using one side of your hip while you're doing it. So that provided me an opportunity. I was so enamored with it and so curious about it. I, you know, talked to the elders and so they gave me some of the rationale and and the giveaway. So my son was attending, um, he was in a private school and we lived in Ottawa. He was in grade two at the time. And um, they had asked the parents, um, there was a, a diversity or inclusion type of day for the children. And I thought to myself, I said, why don't we do like reenact a round dance with the kids? And so we, um, you know, did, you know, we had my husband, um, provided the round dance music because um, there's a specific kind of beat I guess that you need for it and so all these little grade tours um, there was about nine of them in the class and so we did it and they loved it but they especially loved the giveaway part of it because we gave them you know little gifts that they could take home and um, the response from that from the you know the kids shared with their parents and just that they wanted to know everything from Sagate. They wanted to know what his name meant, where he was from. Like it was just the curiosity that it generated on the, you know, from these children was really, really heartwarming. So, you know, just an example of me taking what I learned and then sharing it with a group of children. And, um, you know, some of the parents even phoned us to talk to us and wanted to know more about the culture and, and so that's just a, an example of, of uh, you know, 
being able to my way of sharing um, an opportunity for people to reconcile to know the truth and to also know that we had a very vibrant and strong culture one that made us happy Chumigwech. Oh, thank you sandy that's beautiful um and thank you so much for being here uh dana over to you thanks Anne. hi everyone my name is dana um, I'm joining you today in Calgary in the traditional territory of Treaty 7 and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. I'm joined by my two sons. Uh, this is Leo and Ben. Uh, they're 10 and 8 years old. Um, I am non-Indigenous. I'm a settler to this land. Um, so I, uh, I'm joining you today to, to share a bit about what it means to be um, a mom with, uh, with young, young people in our lives and, and how we're how we're, um, how our reconciliation journey is as a, as a family. And um, I think about my own upbringing, my own childhood and going to school. And like many of you, I think Anne mentioned it as well. We, we didn't get exposed to that. It was a part of our history that, um, that was not taught. So I'm, I'm really encouraged by what I'm, I'm seeing now in, uh, in the boys' school and what they're learning. Um, and I don't want it to stop there. So I think that's that's kind of the, our main uh, focus for us is not letting it be a one day a year um, opportunity for learning or just just let them learn about it in school. We're trying to really bring that bring that home and make it a part of our every everyday life. And um, you know the beauty of, of children when they're they're born, they're born without bias and without stereotypes. And um, so to really try and embrace that as a young age. Some of the things that we do as a family, um, books, we're going to have story time today, which I'm really excited about, but that's just a an, an really easy opportunity to, to share Indigenous culture and Indigenous stories um, through books. Uh, listening to music. We found a, an, an Indigenous playlist on Spotify this morning. So, you know, putting that on in the kitchen and listening to that as we're having breakfast, that's an, that's an easy way to go about it. Um, but I wanted to share with you too a, an event that we were at. Actually, Anne and I ran into each other a few weeks ago at an Indigenous market in Calgary here. And, you know, an Indigenous market was a great way for the kids to, to come and see Indigenous arts and crafts and be exposed to that, which was fantastic. Uh, we could have spent all day there, couldn't we? It was, it was awesome. Um, but also the opportunity for them to bring their own money and to, to purchase and support an Indigenous business. Um, and, you know, Ben, you had, had bought a, a craft from a boy about his age. And just to be able to see that, that connection um, of, of two children um, was, really, was really impactful. So we're really looking for ways to, to make um, this reconciliation journey real and tangible and a part of our everyday lives. And again, not leaving it just for this one day a year or you know one one event throughout the year. Um, so Anne, thank you for letting us be a part of this. We're really honored to be a part of uh, this event today. So thank you. Thank you, and thanks so much for picking up the invite. Um, and so so we will have uh, Mike, my good friend Mike Lickers, uh, go next. Typically, it would be um, it would be protocol to have our elders go first, and Mike is certainly one of my. My main teachers, um, I've known him for many years and just have such gratitude. Um, when I was talking to Mike about this session and, and asking him to participate, he said, well, in the intros, just let me go last. So if we're short on time, I'll just be really quick. Mike, don't be really quick. Um, so please do share, share what you have to share um, with folks. We're, we're right on track. So we'd love to hear from you. OK, thanks. Thanks, and say I go, it's going to go, which means hello and great peace to each and every one of you today as we start um, this very historic day, uh, I'm just gonna share a couple of little small snippet things with you. Um, are you gonna tell a story uh, to each people? Yes, I'm gonna tell a story. Can I, can I, can I come too? Can I come too to the storytelling? Okay, sit down and let me tell you a story, my friends. I, I, I want to hug all of you first. So big hugs. I don't have my orange shirt on today, but I'm a turtle. I come from the turtle clan of the Haudenosaunee, the Gayangahaga people of the Six Nations of the Grand River. And some of my most profound shifts in reconciliation 
have been with young people. Watching young people flourish and grow is probably one of my greatest and most inspiring moments from watching them to uh, as indigenous and non-indigenous young people to exploring who they are as human beings. They have such wonderful and powerful gifts. I think that the most important thing for us to share with them is that every one of us has the ability to do great and wonderful things in this world. And so I would like to say that as I grew up, one of the young people that I worked with was an Indigenous boy that was taken away from his family when he was really, really young. And he was placed into another family. And then when he came out to me into the bush, as Michelle said, I spent a lot of time in the mountains hanging out there, talking to animals and plants and all of those wonderful things. And when the young people would come and see me, I would get a chance to teach and share with them. And this young boy came out and he had no idea who he was. It was interesting because it was the first time I saw anybody with purple hair. I never saw that before. And this young boy came up and he had his hair purple and he was clearly an indigenous person. And we spoke around the fire and we talked and he said that he must have been the last of his, his tribe because he didn't know anybody. And so through several stages of reconnecting with him to his biological family, he found his real family. He found his brother. He found his sister, his brother who was a twin. And he's now working in his community doing the exact same thing as I did. And he's allowing young kids to reconnect with their cultural identity, to reconnect with that history. And as my friend Murray Sinclair says, to reconnect with the original truth. I was talking to him the other day, and this profound shift in all of us as Canadians is really going to come to fruition. Since 2015, when the Truth and Reconciliation Report came out, it was, it was a big ceremony. And I think mostly Indigenous people paid attention. But it wasn't until my friends that they found a whole bunch of little people that the rest of Canada paid attention. And so my job has always been to inspire young people to look inside themselves to see that really powerful gift that they have and to share that eventually with other people. And so I am deeply honored and grateful to be here today sharing with you. I could speak for hours about who I am, the families that I'm connected to, the roots that I have across Turtle Island. But my friends, as the story goes, there's always another story to be told. And my friends are always waiting to hear good, really cool stories. So I will see you later. Big hugs from me. And thank you for being here. And thanks, Anne, for putting this on today. Uh, thank you. Thank you all so much. You're um, very much an, an inspiration for me. And I'm just really grateful for, um, for you being here. And for everybody who's joining and learning, and it's really cool that as soon as I, I asked you people to join, everybody was really enthusiastic. So um, really happy about that. Uh, so you've got a chance to, to get a sense of, of who our panelists are, of the different opportunities that we have to learn. Um, we do learn better through conversation and through experience. So we are going to go into these breakout rooms. Um, but you're going to pick where you're going to go. So we're going to spend about 15 minutes in these breakout rooms. Um, room one is smudging with Mike. He'll offer a teaching and thank you and gratitude to Mike for that. Um, as Hanley talked about, she'll be doing story time um, for ages two to five. So that younger, younger age group. Um, and Dana's going to uh, offer some stories for that sort of five to 10 age range. As Michelle uh, talked about, she, she is well-versed in Métis history and customs and so is going to share that. And, and we're aiming for that at around an age nine to 15, sort of that junior high um, age. 
Uh, room five is, is talking more about how to pull out curiosity and be curious for as we get into that high school age and sort of how to encourage that curiosity of, of your young people who are young adults. And um, perhaps when you, you don't have that information yourself. And so how do you go and figure that out together? Um, and then Justin is, as, as he mentioned, he works, he chairs the Calgary Aboriginal Urban Affairs Committee. And so a lot of that work is encouraging action and allyship. And so uh, Justin is gonna talk about that and we'll, we're aiming for that at sort of that 13 plus age range. Um, if you don't want to go to a breakout room, you don't have to. You can just hang out here with me. My son Bobby and I made a playlist this morning, as uh, Dana talked about. There's tons of great contemporary Indigenous music, and so we'll just be putting that music on and pausing the recording, and, and you can just hang out here with us as well. So um, thank you, Coral. Yes, there is never enough time in breakout rooms. That is always where, like, there's fantastic discussion, but then also people saying, but what, I, I can't just pick one. I want to talk to everybody because you're all such amazing people. Um, so we're we're trying to find that balance. So thank you so much. Um, we are here here together for this last half hour, and this is where we can take some of that great conversation from the breakout rooms and and pull it in and give people a glimpse of what you were talking about. And so I'll I'll start just by opening it up. I have. Um, a question and thank you those of you who shared your questions in advance. Um, so I'm going to throw throw one out to my panelists and whoever would like to um, sort of a couple of you to, to share your thoughts on it um, to go there, but then please use the chat to ask questions use the raise hand function all participants. Um, to to carry on with conversations or reflections uh, that have stuck with you so. So please do prepare. This is like that open Q and A uh, time that that is for you to take where you want to. Um, one of the questions that came up, and a lot of them are along the same lines of um, starting conversations with that sort of six year old, seven year old age. And one that really struck me was, um, how do you address and support settler guilt in young children? And so when children hear the stories of injustice. Um, there can be obviously the feelings of guilt and, and as I say, many of you will have heard me say in my trainings that it, it's hard to be human and not feel guilt when you hear the stories and you understand what's happened. Um, but guilt is not a productive emotion. It, it doesn't serve us very well. And so it's important that all of us move through it um, in, and into a place of action. And so I'm curious from any of our panelists um, how you can do that at a level with with that um, sort of grade one two at that at that age. Anybody want to take a cut at that? Feel free to unmute. And I can talk about my own experience. Thanks, Emily. Uh, and it is. I feel like when we feel guilt, fear, and shame were immobilized. And I use that as a way to let go of that feeling, to accept it and identify it, but let go and really lean into the process of reconciliation and what that might mean. And, and being proud of who you are as an individual and, and your ancestry, and then celebrating shared experiences. I really focus on making connections and sharing and celebrating. And when I talked earlier in the room, I like to use books that show happiness and love and reciprocity. And that's how I try to manage these feelings of guilt or shame. And then it becomes like, okay, let's, let's talk more. Let's mobilize and take action. Thanks so much. And um, and just want to, um, Elizabeth, acknowledge the that. Um, so Dana, I, I wonder, sounds like some stuff came up in, in your room. And I wonder if it might be helpful to uh, to unpack or address that with uh, with everyone here. Yeah, thanks, Anne. Yeah, I saw that um, that comment. Thank you for for sharing that. Yeah, we read um, we read the story. I am I am not a number, so it's it's definitely um, you know uh, 
graphic uh, description of what, what happened to many children. So it can be tough to, uh, to unpack or to hear often for the first time if, if children haven't heard those stories. So, um, and definitely age group is, as we mentioned in ours, we had some, you know, more five-year-olds and then some older kind of 10-year-olds. So uh, that can be a big, big age difference in understanding. I think the first time, um, you know, we, we read that story uh, in my family, uh, definitely lots of questions and lots of, um, of that settler guilt for myself and, and my children as well. Um, and I'd say it's okay to, um, to have those feelings, to be able to, you know, sit in those feelings and let them come through. Um, and then as Hannah Lee was saying, then moving that into action um, is really the best way to work through it. Asking questions, being curious, um, and not not kind of staying in that that state either. So um, yeah, it's uh, and it's definitely a work in progress because the more you you read, the more you learn, the more things that that can come up for ourselves and and for our children. So um, yeah, we d we definitely had a book that was. Uh, uh, very vivid and and told some real real truths, um, which is is part of today. Um, but I know that can be tricky with with children as well. Thanks for that, Dana. Other other questions. We might open it up for um, for folks to use the raise hand function. So in Zoom, that's probably in your reactions. Um, at the bottom, if you want to, to use that raise hand to follow up on any of the conversations that you had been having, um, or to, to bring some of those into, into this, uh, and so everybody else can hear those as well. All right, we'll continue to invite those, and, but Michelle, I'm going to call on you because you um, had been talking about Métis history. And I think that's something that um, has not, I think is, is also late to the narrative, I guess. I, I think many of my experiences have been um, sort of people use, use the term, terms Indigenous and First Nations as if they're in interchangeable. And, and of course, Indigenous is a more umbrella term for the First Peoples of Canada, including Métis, Inuit, and First Nations. Um, and so maybe I'll, I'll invite you to bring a bit of, of what you shared or some of those perspectives of um, why it's important to also seek out Métis perspectives um, and how that might be unique from what we often hear in the narrative. Mm, thank you so much, Anne. That's a really great question. So um, just to summarize, if I'm hearing the question right, it's how do we engage and seek understanding for Métis perspectives within the conversation of reconciliation? So if I hear that um, accurately, then um, I, I just want to say it's it's things like this. You know, I, I really um, respect and your your efforts in bringing the space together and inviting you know just a Métis voice. And I think that when we uh, look at the Métis history, um, uh, that would be about 200 years old, right? In terms of like the fur trade and the governance system and even the script. So when we look at um, treaties and as we're getting to understand, um, you know, the history of, of what it meant from the perspective of indigenous peoples, um, then we also must look and acknowledge and, and, and relearn Canada's history around the script system. And so I think starting there, you really get to know how Métis people were treated. And then there's even like, um, there's some real thick books in terms of you know uh, the Métis experience and the residential school system as well so there is a lot of information and in inviting Indigenous voices um, Indigenous elders in terms of Métis history I think is really important and it really share it really shows our understanding of and respect of Métis peoples as Indigenous peoples within that within that group and so acknowledging acknowledging that the language the, um, the culture, wherever you go in Canada, especially in the West from North to South, um, the dialects are different, the experiences are different, you know, Métis urban youth have very different experiences than Northern youth within settlements. So just inviting those conversations and those perspectives is, is a great start. So thank you. Thanks so much for that. Um, Sandy, I think I'm going to go to you next with a question about different uh, community events and ways to engage in those, but I'm also going to give a heads up to Mike um, that I am wondering if you would be open to sharing one of my favorite stories. 
which is about uh, that gift that we have inside ourselves and the creature that discovered it. And so I'm going to look for Mike to tell me a thumbs up if that's okay um, for that. Now I can't find you in my list. I'm assuming. Hey, so. I'm here. Yes, I can. Thank you. Um, so Sandy, a lot of the questions that we had were around, um, you know, how do I participate in my daily life or what can, what can we do? And you talked in your opening about experiencing culture and just how that experience um, can, can open up so many questions. And so I'm wondering what advice you would give for, for the parents and teachers and grandparents on the line. Michelle talked about going to a Sundance and how that's, um, you know, a different level of appropriateness. So how, how can we distinguish when we know where we're supposed to be um, as settlers and what might not be appropriate places for us? I'm trying. So I'm thinking, you know, one of the most common things is um, every community, especially during the summer, has some type of event. There's a few things. There's treaty days, which some communities um, make it open to others. So they reenact the treaty. There's also the um, the powwows. There's almost every community, at least in the prairies, has something like that. Um, in, in BC, they have potlatches, but those ones I think you'd have to be invited to. I don't know if they're open to the public, but I think a lot of um, information can be found, um, you know, even through the friendship centers, almost every um, city has a friendship center or a local place, indigenous gathering place. A lot of places are coming up now with with those. Um, there's a lot of different organizations within the city. Um, and even, you know, stopping someone at someone who, who is Indigenous and asking them, and they can certainly tell you, you know, what's going on and what's available. So, um, and there is more and more things becoming available. Like even if you go, like in Calgary, there's the um, library, which has a lot of information. Um, you know, at, there's galleries, there's, there's so many options in terms of how you can participate. So um, I think gone are the days when people could say I can't find something. There's a lot of things going on. There's a lot of films being shown, you know, at film festivals, where Indigenous filmmakers are, you know, highlighted. So um, there are a number of things that people can do. And I think one of the things is, um, you know, go in with an open heart, open mind. Um, and one of the things I would say to people is to be humble and, you know, maybe watch and listen more than, you know, do and talk in some of these events. Um, I had a friend um, who was, there's a big uh, powwow that we would all attend when I lived in Ottawa and she was quite upset that people were taking pictures like non-indigenous people were you know sort of getting in people's faces taking pictures doing she just felt it was not being um very respectful so i think if you are attending you know be respectful of the of the event that you're at and um you know be humble and i think that's that's important thanks for that sandy and coral i see we've got your hand up so happy to to have you come off mute and share a question there. Yeah, thank you for, for this and wonderful and all the speakers. And I really hope I don't offend anybody with my question, but uh, when, I, when I think of uh, Canada, we, we tend to hide from history. We, we've seen it time and time again. Um, I think back to Normandy, it was the last country to actually recognize the soldiers that had served um, with a memorial at, at Juneau Beach. I, I, and now I'm thinking about what happened with the discovery of residential schools. And a part of me fears that we're gonna just hide that. It's gonna disappear and it's gonna take all of us that are living to hopefully make it a part of history. If anyone's ever gone to Germany, you walk, there, there's certain places you can go to and you can see evidence of the concentration camps. There's museums that have been set up to honor what had happened to to the people there and i'm just wondering what 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 can we do you know i, I don't want to i don't want to offend anyone but i really do feel like we need to make this a part of history so anyone that visits they're well aware that this is a part of 
you know, that, you know, who we are. Um, so yeah, I, I put that out there without hopefully not offending anybody. Not at all. That's what this space is for. And Justin, uh, hopefully I, I queued you up. I'd love for you to offer your thoughts. Yeah, this is, uh, that is a sensitive topic, right? Um, we can see the most, most recent comment um, with, would have been in the last six months or so when, when we had members removing the statue of Sir Winston Churchill, Sir, Sir John A. Macdonald, sorry, not Winston Churchill. Um, in, in restitution of what was happening. And then we had comments by our premier in Alberta saying, we can't make these changes because it's going to erase history, right? And, and that's what you're kind of talking about, Cora, where Canada kind of hides it. And I think we need to go back to the comment by the Honorable Marie Sinclair, where we're not trying to hide it. We need to memorialize it. We need to remember it. And so one of the things that has happened in some residential schools that are located on indigenous land is that they've decided not to tear down those facilities. They've decided to sometimes repurpose those. And in those facilities, there are pictures, there are stories, and it creates a space where people can learn about it. What we need to do, more people need to go and learn and share. Unfortunately, it's not put out there in mainstream media where these all are. I, I, I know of one in BC. They, they eventually converted into a, a museum, or not a museum, sorry, a casino, um, in St. Eugene's Resort. And that was a residential school. But when you go into there, I went in there with my wife. And, and interestingly enough, her grandparents, or, and, and some of you may know, I, I'll add to this. My, my wife is non-Indigenous and her family is non-Indigenous. Well, they told me there's a wonderful casino, St. Eugene. They knew nothing about what it was because the information is not out there. It's not shared. Right? I explained to them what it was and the travesties that occurred. And they were just like, oh, wow, I didn't know about that. And they were open. And then they discussed it with people that they know in England, that this is what happened in Canada. So it just has to be more and more discussion that happens. That's the only way we're going to be able to share the history about it. Thanks for that, Justin. Mike, I know you have probably thoughts on this too, and then I'll invite you to, to share that story. Yeah, Corey, that was a fantastic question. Um, one of the things that just recently has unfolded at the uh, Mohawk um, uh, Institute, which was the very first residential school in Canada opened in 1832 and ran until 1970. Is, uh, there's actually an opportunity right now to do virtual tours um, of the school. It's right next to the Woodland Cultural Center, which is a preservation center. Um, preserving the history of residential schools, um, and it's it's not uh, it's not a museum. It's not that kind of a context. I think it's more of an opportunity for Canadians to actually <clears throat> go down the halls, travel down the halls, uh, to actually talk and listen to survivors of the residential school, to listen to parents, um, and to find out. So, as soon as I track down the link, I'll send that in to you. <clears throat> there were two free open virtual tours. Um, and now it's it's kind of closed. It's a, a campaign called Save the Evidence, um, and it's specifically out there, unfortunately, in Alberta. So if you're in Ontario, you're lucky because then you can go to Brantford and to Six Nations and see this experience, be part of it. Uh, if you're out here, I think, like Justin said, maybe St. Eugene's this might be the close, uh, closest uh, in this area. Um, there's also several schools that have actually turned into academic institutions um, and it's really it's really I don't think there isn't a conversation in Canada right now where we're ever going to let that go unheard in the future um, and and it will take all of us it will take all of us walking together if I talk about the two-row wampum belt in that context 
um, our relationship with non-Indigenous people coming to Turtle Island, the two row wampum belt signified that the relationship can exist together, but don't force everything on each other. And I think we need to return to those original treaties and, and agreements and, and uh, arrangements to really understand what they meant. Because certainly for 400 years, the Dutch have been celebrating and recognizing the two row wampum belt in this country. And that, that significance means that we need to work together in order to survive on this land. We need to work together to be good human beings on this world. And that brings me to my story because Anne had asked me for a story. So my friends, my father was a very talented and gifted orator and storyteller. He has done amazing things in this world and no longer here. And one of the stories that he told me, and I don't know the origins of its location, where it came from, but it was a story that he quite often shared with us. When we didn't necessarily feel good about ourselves, when we came home from school, we got into fights or arguments because people didn't like who we were as human beings. And he would say, son, sit down and let me tell you a story. And my father would say, long time ago, before human beings were here in the world, there was all of the animals. And the creator asked the animals to gather in a circle. And so the, the animals gathered and they got into a circle and the creator said, I have this really powerful gift I want to give to the human beings, but I don't want them to find it too easy. Because if they find it too easy, they're just going to hurt themselves and all of the other people. And so the buffalo came into the center of the circle and he said, hey, give it to me and I'll take it way out to those prairie grasses and I'll hide it there. The two leggeds, the human beings, they'll never find it. And the creator thought for a second and he said, no, I'm afraid one day the human beings are going to cut down that grass. They're going to need to use it and they'll find that gift before they're ready to use it. They don't know what to do with it and they'll just hurt themselves and all of the other humans. So Buffalo went back into the circle and the bear came up, said, give it to me and I'll take it up into the mountains. I'll even put it inside the mountains. The two legged the human beings, they'll never find it there. The creator looked at the bear and he says, no, I'm afraid one day the human beings, they're going to make machines that will be able to go through those mountains. They'll make machines that will be able to take down those mountains and they'll find that gift before they're ready to use it. And they won't know what to do with it and they'll just hurt themselves and all of the other people. So Bear went back into the circle and the salmon came in. And salmon said to the creator, give it to me and I'll take it down the rivers to the lakes. I'll even take it to the deepest part of the ocean. The two legged the human beings, they'll never find it there. And the creator thought for a second and, and he said, no, I'm afraid one day the human beings, they'll make tools and crafts to travel the rivers. They'll be able to go to the lakes. They'll even be able to go to the deepest part of the oceans and they'll find that gift before they're ready to use it. And they'll hurt themselves and all of the other people. So Samuel went back into the circle and the creator posed the question again. And he said, I have this really special gift before the human beings get here. Where can we put it? The eagle flew down into the circle and he said, hey, give it to me and I'll take it way up into the sky. I'll even take it outside and pass those lights. The human beings, the two legged they'll never find it there. And the creators thought, no, I'm afraid one day the humans are going to make machines. They'll be able to travel through the skies. They'll even be able to go up past those lights and they'll find that gift before they're ready to use it. They won't know what to do with it, and they'll just hurt themselves and all of the other people. So Eagle flew back into the circle, and the creator posed the question again. And all of the animals gathered even closer amongst themselves and started talking and talking. And as they were doing that, this little, little small mouse ran up on the shoulder of the creator and whispered into his ear. And the creator just stopped, and he laughed, and he says, that's it. That's exactly where we're going to put it. And all of the wise animals stopped. They wanted to know who it was that came up with the answer. And the creator said, 
I've learned two lessons today. The most important thing is we need to pay attention to the little people in our lives. The ones that don't speak the same way as we do. The ones that don't speak at all. We need to pay attention because sometimes they have the answers and they know where to put this gift. And the creator said, and the second thing is, I know exactly where we're going to put that gift. When the human beings come down here to this world, the two leggeds, we're going to put that gift inside themselves because they'll never look for it there. And only when they're ready to do amazing, beautiful things in the world will they know where that gift is. And my father would say, son, you know you have a powerful gift. But what's going to make it even more special is, with you, is when you give it away freely without expecting anything in return. And thousands of more gifts will come your way. So my friends, today, each of you has come here with an amazing gift. Some of you know what that is. Some of you are storytellers. Some of you are singers. Some of you are writers. Some of you are accountants. I, I'm, I'm shaking every time I hear that. But some of you are amazing, beautiful human beings in your right already. And for the little people that are here, you know, we're here listening to you. You have a powerful gift. And we can't forget those little people. The ones that don't talk the same way. The ones that don't talk at all. And so in your day, my friends, do everything that you can to be a good human being. And together we will change this world. Cora, there is no way now, ever, that we will ever forget the experiences of residential schools, no different than we did with the experiences in Europe. When I was six years old, I was sitting in Auschwitz. When I was older, I was sitting in the trenches in Vimy Ridge, in Normandy, in Ortona, many other places around this world, my friends. And I will never forget the stories that I have the honor and privilege of carrying. And in my lifetime, my goal, my task is to continue to share those stories with both Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in this land. My father said, son, you come from a very proud people, Gayangahaga, and you can never forget that. But now you live in this world, and you have to have a balance of both of those relationships. And if you can do that, then you'll be able to soar to great places. So I want to just say thank you. And thanks, Anne, for the invitation. Thank everybody for being here for today. And most importantly, for the little people. Okay. Can I share something with you? Thank you so much, Mike. Um, that that was that was the perfect story for this perfect time. And thank you so much for honoring us with with sharing that and with your words. Um, my friends, we are we are closing. We are at a time. But what I want to do, I know we've had um, some young people working very hard on um, on those coloring pages. And so I'm going to ask anybody who has done the coloring to keep your camera on. If you haven't been doing coloring, turn your camera off. Um, and that way we should be able to, I should be able to get a picture of every, all of the people who have done coloring and all those pages that we have. Um, and then I'll also ask uh, if you to send me them because I told uh, Diana from Coloring It Forward that I would try to get some pictures of them. So I will turn my camera off um, and, and I will invite everybody who has not done coloring to turn your camera off as well, and everybody who has done coloring to hold it up nice and close. We'll, we'll see how this goes. Um, I am going to say thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody who has joined us.
Um, I'll turn my own video back on and I will be sending, if you've joined this and you're signed up on the distribution list, um, we'll send a recording out for what we have. I also will send a list of ways to continue supporting young people in their reconciliation journeys that you can print and put up in your office. Um, it has some links to different uh, playlists and um, and YouTube shows, as, as was noted. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you for joining us on this day. Thank you for participating and entering into this space of truth and reconciliation that we are still needing both. So thank you, Owen, for the thumbs up. I'm glad you liked it. Thank you to our other young people who have joined us. And I will wish you all a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you very much. And we'll see you again soon, friends. Thank you.